This is uh, what chapter five in your books. <clears throat> this is the only topic that'll be on the next exam. Just guesses. <clears throat> We, uh, I think even from a young age, we have an idea of what a gas is, but that's not good enough for science. <clears throat> we have to complicate things <clears throat> and speak about, you know, particularly with chemistry, speak about what's happening underneath, what we can't see. So what we're saying about gases is that they're semi-independent particles. That is, they're moving so fast, particles are moving so fast, and they're so far apart that they act as if they're not even there. In fact, one of the characteristics of an ideal gas is you can compress it down to nothing. It stays a gas all the way down, as cold and as, as press, pressurized as you want to make it, it's still a gas. Now, in reality, that doesn't happen. <clears throat> but that's the ideal. Like I said before, they can be made of atoms or molecules but they're independent particles and they're moving really fast as compared to liquids or solids. When we say miscible, that means they, they mix uniformly. They're homogeneous mixtures. If you put two or more gases together, they always form a solution every time. <clears throat> and that's largely due to the fact that there's so much room in between each one. They do have mass, though. We can measure their mass, strange as it may seem. And in fact, um, yeah, <clears throat> we're going to do that. Our last lab experiment, we're going to use, we're going to measure the mass of a gas as part of the procedure to determine the molar mass of a given gas. <clears throat> There's this ray. Right? So, <clears throat> since they have mass and they're moving really fast, the individual particles of the gas have kinetic energy. Right? Remember, I don't know if I've shown you this before. Right? Kinetic energy of, of any object can be calculated from the mass and the velocity. We're going to use that formula a little, a little later today. <clears throat> now, if you if you track an individual particle, uh, it has a, a definite trajectory, and it moves a certain distance before it meets another particle. <clears throat> but even though gases are, are very tenuous, they have a lot of space between them. A a cubic meter of gas still has billions of particles in it. So as a practical matter, as a practical matter, we treat uh, the particles in a gas statistically. We assume that they're all random motion. And over a long enough period of time, it does seem that way, that they're moving randomly. We don't have the computing power or the ability to track individual molecules. So we treat them as, as a mass. And in order to do that, we need to use statistics. Now, you're not going to have to do statistics in here, but the, the basis for what we study in gases is statistical. All right, so we're going to look at uh, different gas laws which define how gases behave under certain conditions. <clears throat> and I'll, uh, we'll flesh those out as we go. And I mentioned one of the characteristics of an ideal gas is it's, it's a gas all the way down until there's nothing. <laughs> you squeeze it, cool it. And it stays a gas all the way down. That's a characteristic of an ideal gas. 
We're going to have other equations that define yeah. gas behavior. Right, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. <clears throat> Our most, uh, uh, the, the most necessary gas, gas mixture, as far as we're concerned, is the air we breathe. Right, the Earth's atmosphere is composed of 79% uh, nitrogen and 21% oxygen. And that's uh, atom percent. Um, and then there's the other 1% is largely um, uh, argon. Argon. And then there are minor components in there, like uh, water vapor, uh, carbon dioxide, and some other. Most of it is just those two gases, nitrogen and oxygen. Now we have to we we'll always consider uh, the atmosphere in terms of what shouldn't be there for healthy living. And some places are worse than others. I think we're blessed in this part of the country with fairly clean air, except for certain times of the year when the when the pollen gets bad. <clears throat> but as far as added pollutants go, it's not too bad here unless you get close to uh, some. Uh, point source, like if you, you've had uh, uh, east on 64, eventually you start smelling sulfur. Uh, and sometimes the sulfur comes from springs and sometimes it comes from the paper plant. <clears throat> but for people who work in that industry, that they say that's the smell of money. Anyway, <clears throat> they, it could be considered a pollutant. Um. Or we, if you went to places like Los Angeles, you deal with smog, which is a portmanteau for uh, smoke and fog. <clears throat> and it, it hangs over the city because of what's called a temperature inversion. Normally what you have is uh, the air is heated at the surface of the earth. It rises through the cooler air. But uh, the topography there and the weather at certain times, you get an inversion. You have cold air sitting on, let's see, hot air sitting on top of cold air. It just holds it there. Anyway, um, most of what I have to say about uh, global climate change and man-caused anthropomorphic, that is, uh, global climate effects, is negative because I think most of it is hype. And most of it is is beyond our control or even understanding at this point. All right, so if we have time, I'll jump up on my soapbox. Okay, when we, uh, in order to completely describe a gas, and by the way, historically speaking, gases were studied first when modern science started uh, spinning its wheels, like the 1600s. Um, Gases were studied first because we had the technology to do it and because uh, gases, all gases tend to behave alike under these, under uh, atmospheric and temperature conditions that we experience. So it was easy. All you had to do was just trap any gas and study it and they would all behave similarly. <clears throat> and we had the tools to do it also. So uh, if we want to describe a gas completely, we need four terms, four variables. We need to uh, have a measurement of pressure, measurement of volume, temperature, and a way to measure the amount. And I write a little in there because that's my abbreviation for moles, amount, numbers of. So if we, if we can uh, define the variable of those four terms, then we define the gas and its behavior completely. The first, well, actually, the first um, ability to measure gases came in the form of volume. Volume was the easiest to manage. You could trap a gas in a sealed container easy, and you knew how much the container 
contained. <clears throat> uh, and it was, uh, it wasn't what we would consider a standardized measure, but most people who were working in that area uh, could communicate with each other about volumes of things. And then what we needed was a way to measure pressure. And that came along with the barometer. And that was uh, due to a, an Italian evangelist, uh, Torricelli, mid-1600s. So this is what he did. Uh, at that time, glass blowing was a fairly advanced technology. Um, people were very skilled at creating glass tubes of uniform diameter and reasonably straight. In fact, um, you see uh, window panes in buildings of those of that era. The way they made them was, the glass blowers would would blow a bubble of glass, air into a glass, and it would form, it would start to go round, but they'd hold it over a uh, wet paper and flatten it out. So it'd be a cylinder. And then they'd take that cylinder and they cut, they cut the end off of it and then they cut it down the middle and heat it up a little bit more so it would open up. And that's how they made a glass pane. So when you see these windows with lots of little panes in them, that's because that's the biggest they could make. So they had lots of little panes and they weren't, they let the light through, but they weren't uh, crystal clear like our glass today. I mean, it was kind of like uh, uh, privacy glass. Anyway, they knew how to make uh, tubing of uniform diameter. And all you had to do to uh, close the tube off was just to melt one end of it. And that's what Torricelli did. He had a glass tube with one end melted. And... First of all, you, you stand it up like this, and I'm exaggerating the size. And then he filled it with liquid mercury. Mercury was commonly available, abundantly available in those days. And he, he filled it all the way to the top, and then he put his thumb over it. And then he inverted it and submerged it in a container of mercury. He took it like that, put it in the mercury, then he took his thumb off. And so we didn't think too much about in those days about mercury poisoning. <laughs> At least I would have worn gloves, but they didn't have those. In fact, there was some one school of thought that thought that mercury was uh, healthful and they would consume mercury uh, compounds. That's another story. So here we have uh, Torricelli's beginning barometer, where we, we have the tube inverted in there. And the tube is, is filled with mercury. And then when he took his thumb off, uh, let's see, my animation has got to come along in here somewhere. There it goes. The mercury dropped to a certain level. Okay. Now, uh, this, in fact, was the first vacuum. And a vacuum, by definition, is uh, a, an enclosed area, or actually back in the space would negate that. But on Earth, if you have a, an enclosed a device that's enclosed, there's something in it now, and next there's nothing in it. That's a vacuum. So this, the top of this tube had mercury in it at first, and now it doesn't. So it's a vacuum. It's not a perfect vacuum because we know that mercury is is slightly volatile. So there are probably some mercury atoms floating around up in there. Anyway, uh, Torricelli saw what had happened and he was curious, you know, why did the uh, column drop all the way down to the, the base level? Something had to be holding it up. So he reasoned properly that what was holding it up was a column of air above the pool of mercury was pushing down on that and and driving and delivering that force to the column to hold it up a certain height and to test his theory he took his barometer and he uh went up throw it in the back of his ox cart and went up a mountain and he noticed as he went higher and higher and higher he went the lower the column moved 
And then if he went from his current location down to the sea, he noticed that the uh, column rose. So that was one way to test his theory, and it was correct. So the height of that column relative to its uh, to the pool base was a measure of air pressure. Because he also noted that it didn't matter what diameter the tube was. It could be this big around, it could be that big around. Uh, it would still rise to the same level. So it was an intensive property pressure. Okay, um, let's see. He also noticed that if you, and other people were interested in his invention, if you set your barometer on a desk and just watch it day after day, you could correlate the, the height of the, the mercury column with the weather. And if the weather started to get bad as it was approaching and get, get bad, it would drop. And if the weather, after the weather passed and it cleared up, it would rise back up again. So that's low pressure, high pressure. And we still associate low pressure with storms and high pressure with good weather. Okay. Um, yeah, used to help predict the weather. Okay. There we go. What he noticed was that at sea level and um, standardization of measurements was being developed at this time and the meter was taken as the standard and of course the millimeter was a thousandth of a meter and what they noticed was the height of the column from here to here was 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. So that was taken as one atmosphere pressure. 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere pressure by, by agreement. And um, at some point in the future, I don't remember exactly when this happened, uh, Torricelli was honored by changing millimeters of mercury to the unit of measure tor. But they're the same. Millimeters of mercury and tor are the same measure. Now, when we define pressure, uh, actually, pressure is defined as force per unit area. Right, so when we measure the pressure in our in the tires in our car, we measure it in psi or pounds per square inch. That would be a ratio that we could understand as an intensive property, because if you measure a larger area, you're going to have a larger force for the same pressure back. And this uh, one atmosphere now is fourteen point six nine pounds per square inch. So we've got those equalities. Remember, whenever you have an equality, you have the potential for conversion factor. But these are uh, intensive properties that only have a single unit attached to them rather than a ratio. All right. So we can use this relationship um, let's see, I'm not sure when this measurement was taken. It really doesn't matter. 694 millimeters of mercury at Raleigh County Airport at 2,504 feet above sea level. Right? We would expect that if you go from sea level to a half a mile high, that the pressure is going to drop. And there's the evidence. It goes from 760 to 694. If we calculate the pressure in atmospheres, then we would want to take that 694 millimeters, right, 94, yeah, 694 millimeters of mercury, and we need a conversion factor that will cancel millimeters of mercury, right, and leave us with atmospheres. So we go to our equivalents, right? 
760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere. So we divide 760 into 694, and we should get 0.913 atmospheres, right? It's the same physical phenomenon, air pressure, with different units of measure. That's all we're saying. Okay? So the uh, dimensional analysis come back to haunt you, right? <laughs> if we go up to winter place, and it's another 1,000 feet up, the pressure is going to be lower. 669, convert that by the same procedure, and we find that it's um, 0.88 atmospheres. Let's see, do I have Mount Everest in here? No. We got a conversion from atmosphere to millimeter of mercury. So if we have uh, 1032, 032 atmospheres, where would that be? It'd just be below sea level, wouldn't you? Right? Maybe the Dead Sea or at um, uh, Death Valley, right there below sea level. You would get a, a higher than one atmosphere measurement. And to convert, all we need is to flip this one, because remember, all conversion factors are equal to one. So we just flip it, 760, assuming that's what it wants, yeah, millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury and one atmosphere on the bottom. So atmosphere is canceled, and it should be greater than 760, obviously. Oops. Yeah, 784 millimeters of mercury for that atmosphere. All right. It's a bad thing about these markers. If you leave them up here too long, they're hard to race. I think it's the board. The board started to get porous on its surface. Because this doesn't happen in my office where I have a fresh board. We need to come in and, and uh, rejuvenate the board. Clean it real good. Put a thin coat of WD-40 on it. <clears throat> All right. All right, so uh, those were... Uh, historical measurements of pressure. Once the uh, international system was adopted, we needed a measurement that could be converted, interconverted among the other measurements. And that's where this one, the Pascal, comes in. So the, uh, the SI units for pressure are the Pascal, abbreviated PA. <clears throat> and it's equal to uh, one newton of force per square meter. Now, the meter is a uh, fundamental unit, but the newton is a derived unit, a unit of force, and it's derived from uh, Newton's second law of motion. All that says, Newton says, was that for any mass uh, that you apply this force to, it will accelerate at that value. So if we're looking for force, we need a standard, which is mass is, our standard is a kilogram, right? One kilogram is the fundamental unit for the SI for mass. And acceleration would be, in terms of fundamental units, would be, uh, meters per second per second. Okay. Does everybody understand velocity and acceleration? Velocity is, is how far you go in a certain amount of time. Okay. okay. And it's directional. Acceleration is how your velocity changes with time. So if I go from if I go from 10 meters per second and then I, over, steadily over a certain amount of time, I increase 
to let's say uh, 50 meters per second. Then I've accelerated from 10 to 50. And the acceleration is what's the difference between that over how long it took me? Well, I didn't say how long it takes. But that's why it's meters squared because it's meters per second per second. Okay. So if we put those together, we have kilogram meters per second squared. And that's equal to, by definition, one newton. So now that we know what a newton is equal to, if we have this measurement in a calculation, we have an equivalent for that in case we have to cancel units. If you just leave the Pascal, then you can't cancel units if you need to. But if we know what it's equivalent to, then we can we can put in this in here along with that, and that will give us the ability to convert units. Okay. I said all that just to just to uh, emphasize the fact that the system, the international system, is based upon interconvertibility of units. All right. Um, other ways of expressing. We had, uh, let's see, we have one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to 760 tor. Let me linear here, here. And that's also equal to 14.69 pounds per square inch. And that's also equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. So if on that barometer, if you have uh, 760 millimeters marked up here, then maybe on the other side, you'll have it in inches. And that'll be 29.92 inches equivalent to 760. <clears throat> um, we also have this unit called the bar. The bar is related to Pascal's as um, one bar equals 100,000 Pascal's. And then we have millibar. Um, now, this is a conversion in and of itself related to Pascal's. If we want to put atmospheres in there, then it's more convenient to use a, uh, uh, a millibar, which is a thousandth of a bar. And then now we can say this is 1013 millibar. The millibar is, is something that uh, meteorologists use. If you ever see a, a contour map, well, an isobar map, that is, it's got lines on it. And as the lines follow, they're all, one you follow one line, and that's the same pressure everywhere it goes. And then over here, there's another bar. It's at a, either a higher or a lower pressure, and it follows a line. And those are usually marked millibars. <clears throat> Oh, okay. So now we got um, one atmosphere is also equal to uh, one hundred one point one hundred one thousand three hundred twenty five pascals. So pressure is one of those that has lots of different units available. All right. So this is just an example of a conversion, PSI. We wanna convert uh, from PSI, we can go to atmospheres and then we can go to inches of mercury, right? We use a chain conversion. And uh, that means that 14.45 PSI equals 29.43 inches of mercury. Now, when we, when we do our Boyle's Law, so we're gonna be measuring pressures in pounds per square inch. 
but the atmospheric pressure is going to be probably in millimeters of mercury. So in order to combine those values, we got to convert them to a common unit. So what, what I uh, require, yes, is convert the PSI to atmospheres and convert the millimeters of mercury to atmospheres, then you can add them together. Okay, so if we want to go uh, to millibars from millimeters of mercury, convert to atmospheres, and then we know the relationship of atmospheres to millibars, and that many millimeters of mercury is 957 millibars. Now, those meteorologists, have they have a shorthand way of writing on their maps because there's not a lot of room there. Right? So you, you don't just go to the map and you see 957.3 millibars in there. You see it. It's, it's structured differently. Right? So we're not going to waste time on it here, but just to let you know, if you ever want to look at one of those maps, the numbers are not what they seem. <laughs> we have to interpret them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Determine the exerted pressure of mercury column 760 high by 5 millimeter diameter. All right. Th I think this is just an exercise in, in showing you that uh, actually, I'm going to use this one to talk about why Torricelli chose mercury and not water. Right? He could have he could have put water in that in that tube and done the same thing. Problem is that water is. A mercury is 13.59 times the density of water, which means the water column would have been about 33 feet tall at one atmosphere. But if you use mercury, you can shorten your tube because it's denser. The same force is being applied, but with higher density, the, the column won't go as high. Uh, Plus, mercury is the, the densest metal he could find that was still liquid at room temperature. So it was a perfect, uh, perfect choice, actually. All right, so um, what we're doing here is we're taking, uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure out why. What is that three point? Oh, that's pi. <laughs> um, so what we're doing is we're we're calculating the the area of the circle inside the tube, and then if you take the area of the circle times its height, you have the volume of the column, right? The cylinder. Right? Once you have the volume of the cylinder, and you convert it to the appropriate units, then you can convert it into an equivalent mass. Of mercury. So we end up with, with a column that's 760 millimeters tall is 0 0.2028 kilograms in mass. That's what that conversion does. And then the force that's applied is uh, this kilograms times meters. Uh, th and this is. Uh, it's usually abbreviated with a small g. It's the, the gravitational acceleration. Right? So mass times g, mg, is uh, uh, the weight of any object or its force in Earth's gra gravity is equal to um, the, its mass times that g factor, which is acceleration of gravity. That's what we're doing there. So that top part is the, the force that's due to its mass. Okay, in newtons. And then the, the square meters uh, are the same as up here, right? This term right here is the square meters area. So that gives us force per unit area. And as long as the units are in newtons per square meter, we have pascals. So at 760 millimeters of mercury, that's where we got the conversion to um, 
101, 101,300 um, pascals equals one atmosphere. And all we've done for kilopascals is just moved it over. One, two, three. 101.3 kilopascals. Okay. That's just some, ex some extreme unit conversions. That's all it is. Okay. Uh, I kind of got those out of order. This is our first gas law that we're interested in. And the one we're going to be investigating next week. This is Boyle's law. Robert Boyle was an Englishman and he came along um, about the same time as Torricelli, only he was using mercury in his experiments also, but he wasn't creating a barometer. Um, the unit of measure, of course, was was common among scientists in those days. Millimeters of mercury, they knew was a measure of pressure. So what Robert Boyle did was he wanted to investigate the relationship between these two variables. And if you do that, that means that this one has to be constant and that one has to be constant. Otherwise, if they vary on their own, you don't, you don't know what they're, what they're doing in the background. So if this is constant, constant temperature and constant number of moles, constant amount of gas, then you can investigate the variability between these two pressure and volume. And that's what he did. Uh, he used what he called a J tube. So instead of uh, using a straight tube like Torricelli did, he took, he sealed off one end and then he bent the bottom of it. So his J tube looked like this. Okay. And right now it's filled with air. So what he, what he did was he put mercury in here. All right. And, and it ran down the first little bit of mercury, pulled up in the bottom like that. And then he put a little bit more, right? Made it a little bit higher. And then he put more. And when he put enough to where it would touch the inner curve that sealed all of this gas in there. And there was no changing it after that point. That made the number of moles constant. How about the temperature? Well, uh, these experiments occur over a period of just minutes. So the, the room temperature is going to stay the same. As long as you don't put your J-tube in the sun coming through the window or whatever. Or he could have conducted it in his basement, in his root cellar, or... Actually, you could submerge the whole thing in a in a container of ice water, you know, solid ice and water. Temperature is going to be constant at zero degrees. Whatever he did, held these two constant, and then he kept adding uh, mercury until he noticed that as he got up here like this, this one was a little bit lower. And then he he added more mercury, and now it only went up to about right there. So he reasoned that the weight of the mercury pushing on that gas that's trapped in his tube, plus the atmospheric pressure, and he had a separate barometer we could measure that. So he could, he could take that value and the height of the mercury uh, and the difference between the two, see, the difference between the two here would be a measure of the pressure on the gas inside that trapped part of the tube. Uh, and what we've got coming here is a modern representation. So we're, what he's changing, excuse me, actually this graph is, is reversed. Remember what goes on the x-axis? Independent variable, what you're changing. Right, we put the pressure, and he's changing the pressure by adding mercury. So the pressure should be here. 
atmospheres or millimeters of mercury. And the response should be here, volume. And the, since the tube was uniform in diameter, then a measure of the height, the measure of this height would be proportional to the volume, right? Because the diameter is not changing. But we can measure the volume in say milliliters, whichever. And what he noticed is as he increased the pressure, the volume went down. And you can start up here with low pressure and have this volume. And as he increased the pressure, the volume would decrease. And he just kept it going like that. So we got a curve here. Like that. When he measured, just plotted the raw data. Now that's gonna it's gonna be similar appearance here. It's going to make that curve, whether we put the pressure here or the volume here. One other thing that we noticed also, or he noticed, was that when he took the value for the pressure and multiplied it times the value for the volume, he always got a constant value, or pretty near constant, within experimental error. In, this, in our chosen values here, we come out perfect. Pressure volume is 100 but I'm sure there was some variability in his. This is Boyle's law. Pressure times volume of, of, a, of a trapped gas is equal to a constant value. And when they're plotted, give you a curve, and this curve is a special kind of mathematical expression. It's a hyperbola. Now we've only, we're only uh, mapping one quadrant of the hyperbola. In math class, if you remember, have you had hyperbolas in math class? No. There, there would also be a mirror image over here. Okay. But we're only interested in the positive, positive side. What we're saying is that as pressure increases, volume decreases. That is inverse, an inverse proportion of the variables. As one increases, the other decreases. And it doesn't have to be a straight line. Sometimes it is, but in this case, it's not. And what you'll always find with an inverse proportion is when you plot the data, you get a negative slope. That's negative, positive would be this way. Only <laughs> with this data, the slope is constantly changing. Right? The tangent to that curve gives you the slope at any one point. So the slope is changing. Now that's not much good for scientists. I mean, if, we got, if we're gonna have a slope, it better stay sustained. So um, this does illustrate that it's an inverse proportion, but it's not very useful the way it is. We're going to make it useful in a minute or two. There's our inverse proportion. Now, as a practical matter, let's see, let me erase this. Whenever you conduct the experiment uh, anew, that constant will probably change. Temperature may have changed. You may trap a different number of moles of gas. So the constant is only constant for that experiment. So a more useful approach is to say, okay, uh, if we want to use uh, a given experiment to solve a problem, we need something where we don't have to deal with that constant. So at one point, in that graph, pressure times volume equals our constant. Under the same conditions, if we keep if we keep moving through the experiment, then the constant is also equal to conditions, the new conditions at a different point in in the procedure, right along here somewhere. Well, notice that 
as long as these conditions don't change, then these two are equal. So we've got that expression is more useful. This is what I call before and after. And if you, if it's like any equation, these are four unknowns. If you know three of them, you can solve for the fourth. And with pressure and volume, it doesn't matter what units you use. The units here are going to be the same. Atmosphere, atmosphere, millimeters, mercury, millimeters, mercury, milliliters, milliliters, uh, liters, liters. I don't know, whatever you want to say. Right. If, if the volume is in milliliters here and you fill in the rest of it, then the answer is going to be in milliliters. Okay, so that's what this is all about. And let's see, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time because I've got several laws to get through. But this example wants us to find the final volume if we change the factors. Now, when you're, when you're looking at a word problem and trying to decide which uh, law to use, you look for these factors, pressure, volume, and these two are constant. And then you ask yourself, do any of these factors change during the problem? as it's proposed. If it starts off at this pressure and ends up at that pressure, and it starts off at this volume, and they want you to answer that volume, you know it's a before and after type problem with Boyle's law. And you can either plug the values in, solve for the unknown, or solve for the unknown, and then plug the values in. It's your choice. All right, so there's the answer to that problem. Um, let's see, this is another problem that, uh, approaches it from a different, we've got two volumes and one pressure. We're going to find out what the second pressure is. Now, when you, when you set up a problem like this, I, I personally, I think it's useful. Once you decide what problem it is, if it's a Boyle's law, then take your word problem values and put them in here. Right? If this is initial values, then you got something there, something there. And if you got something here in the final values, then that's the one you solve for. If you do it that way, then when you plug it in the formula, you won't get them in the wrong place because they go in the wrong place, wrong answer comes out. All right. Next, I think. Yeah. Next is Charles Law. I think Charles was Frenchy. Charles Law came along when, after the thermometer had been invented. Up to this point, we didn't have a reliable way of measuring temperature. So Charles Law came along and he was interested in gases, but he wanted to measure, he wanted to uh, define the relationship between volume and temperature. So that means moles had to be constant and pressure had to be constant. Okay, so we needed a device that would uh, allow the volume to change under constant pressure and the temperature to change and affect the volume. So one way to do that is a cylinder of uniform diameter and a piston in there trap the gas, and then you have a force here. Say you put a one kilogram mass on it, and that plus atmospheric will be constant. And then you control the temperature here. So the temperature will change here, the volume will be there, and you can read it, uh, calibrate it along the edge. That, that's one way to do it. And what did he discover? Let's see, this was, uh, yeah, he was French. Jacques. That's French for Jack, I guess. 1787. Okay. 
So that was uh, 100 years later than uh, Boyle. They had to wait that long to for some other scientist to develop a useful temperature scale and devices that would measure the temperature reliably that could be calibrated. Right. Have we talked about that yet? Temperatures, Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin? Yeah. Yeah, we did talk about those. Okay, good. Um, so when he conducted his experiment, he got these results. And for our purposes here, we got degrees Celsius and cubic centimeters, which is milliliters. And he plotted, these are plotted correctly. Uh, temperature is on the x-axis because that's what the experimenter is controlling. Temperature and volume is here. And he got a series of... You notice as the temperature increases, the volume increases as long as the pressure and moles are constant. So let's give him his data here. Here we go. There's his data points. And um, and this will this line will vary depending on what gas you use. I think. See. Use a different gas, we get a different volume at a different temperature. No, no, it won't. It all depends on how many moles are trapped in the, in the external pressure. Uh, so it's consistent for, for all gases, even mixtures of gas. So you can trap air in there and do the same thing. But notice that it, it passes through, in this case, it passes through uh, one cubic centimeter as the y-intercept. Well, um, the problem is temperature scale. As long as the temperature scale is positive, you got no problem. The law works. In other words, volume divided by temperature equals a constant. No, it has to be that way because as volume increases, temperature increases to keep that value constant. So uh, a variable divided by a variable equals constant is the, the quotient makes it constant, whereas the product makes it inverse for Boyle's law. And we can we can reason this one the same way we did with uh, with Boyle's and say V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, a before and after situation. Here's the problem. You can't use negative values of temperature in there. If you stick a negative in there, that throws everything in a whack. So about the same time, uh, a new temperature scale was developed called the Kelvin. It was based upon the Celsius, but it gave us all positive values. In other words, zero on the Kelvin scale is absolute zero. There is no negative. So when you use this law, the temperatures have to be converted to Kelvin. They have to be made positive. And remember, in order to do that, Kelvin equals um, Celsius plus 273. They've got some decimals out there, but 273 is good enough. And this is how it was developed. I don't know, did I show you this one? How Kelvin developed his? If we extend this, let me make some room up here. If we extend, extend the x-axis out here, this is Degree C, this would be zero on that scale. And I need to do this. Let's make it like this. So that's as far as it goes. Say in the, in the real world, we're going to extrapolate. Remember extrapolate? Go beyond your data set. Extrapolate down to where volume is zero. What temperature would that be? Right For an ideal gas, of course. That temperature would be minus 273 degrees C. Well, now Kelvin sets up his scale. That's zero. Zero K. So now zero on the Celsius is 273 on the Kelvin scale. 
But the point is, they're all positive values. So they don't mess up your, your formula. All right. Oh, <clears throat> I don't know if it's a minor point or not. Charles didn't publish his work. He distributed by letters with his uh, colleagues, but his work wasn't published until uh, Guy Lussac published it in 1807. But he gave Charles credit for it. That's why it's called Charles Law. Some scientists were more ethical back there than they are today. <laughs> you want to take credit for it, especially in politics. Okay, that's Charles Law. And remember, we're still talking about law. Nobody's trying to say why these things happen. They're just saying, this is what we observe. And this is the expression that works every time, as long as these conditions are met. Next, next we've got, well, we've got some problems that we can solve with Charles Law, and we do them the same way as Boyle's. We just identify, we set it up, B1, T1, B2, T2. Take the word problem, extract the values that we need and the ones that's unknown, and then plug it in the formula. Right, it works the same way as the others. And there are plenty of examples in, in your uh, review documents, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, mainly because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, another example of Charles Law. You also have to watch your units. Temperature in particular. Temperature, when you're working with gases, temperature has to be Kelvin. Just make that a, a hard and fast rule. Anytime when you're dealing with gases, make the temperature Kelvin. All right. These are all before and after problems. The last law we want to work with is Avogadro's law. For Avogadro's law, which came along, <clears throat> um, it was first postulated by Avogadro in the, in the first part of the 19th century. It wasn't widely accepted until after his death. But what Avogadro was drawing attention to was solving problems under constant pressure and temperature. Constant pressure and constant temperature. And one, he wanted to know the relationship between volume and moles. So as it turns out, volume divided by moles is a constant. That means that these two, value, these two variables are directly proportional. As one increases, the other increases. And let's see. And you can treat this the same way as the others. Right? V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. That's the more useful version. Now, um, <clears throat> Avogadro's law is often expressed in, in another way. And I, I don't know if I've done this before, I probably have. If you have two gases, the volume of their containers are exactly the same. Have I done this before? I'll do it again. If the volume of these two containers are exactly alike, they contain gas, the temperature inside the containers are exactly alike, and the pressures inside the containers are exactly the same, then the number of particles in each one has to be exactly the same. That was Avogadro's revelation. And it was, it came at just the right time. Only he didn't disseminate the information. It was disseminated by one of his students. Um, my mind's gone blank. Let's see, what was his name? 
Uh, maybe I've got it in here somewhere. Do I? No, I don't. Uh, I hate it when that happens. Anyway, I'm we'll calling his student. <laughs> His student had published uh, work based upon Avogadro's work. And there was a big meeting in uh, Bavaria, southern Germany, in, in 1860. Uh, and all these big brains were coming together. They were from universities and from companies. The problem they were having was they only stood, they only understood chemical reactions in terms of masses. They were more like uh, glorified cooks. A mass of this and a mass of that gives you a product. And the universities couldn't solve the problem, and the companies were losing money hand over fist because when their reaction went wrong, they didn't know how to fix it. Right? They just knew they could adjust some things and see if it worked. <clears throat> what they didn't understand, that reactions are not based upon mass mass. Reactions are based upon numbers, numbers of atoms, numbers of molecules. That's where Avogadro came in because... These two could have different masses, not equal to mass two. But if you knew that you had something in here like, uh, I don't know, um, nitrogen gas here and hydrogen gas here, and they were all these were equal, then you had the same number of moles in each one. Then you could measure the masses of the gases and ratio the mass of this gas to the mass of that gas. And as it turned out, the ratio between these two would be 28 to 2 or 14 to 1. And all you had to do was establish a, a mass, a molar mass for one gas and compare everyone else to it. And then it would just snowball from there. And once you knew the molar mass of a gas and the molar mass of a compound, you could determine how many moles were actually going into the reaction when you say a mass of this goes here, a mass of this goes here. Now you convert that to moles mole. You knew what they, was, what the, they were doing in the reaction. And that was all due to Avogadro. And of course, his, his student, uh, I hate it when that happens. His student uh, published this paper and went to that Congress and presented his work and handed out reprints. And everybody uh, politely took his papers and went back to their universities and companies. Some of them actually read, read his uh, report and applied it and solved their problems. You know, and the word started to spread. Say, here's how you do it. <clears throat> okay. So, and this leads us to the concept uh, to the uh, techniques of stoichiometry. We've done stoichiometry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That's where it all came from. It's all based upon Avogadro. And uh, let's see. Did I do the before and after already? Yeah, I think I did. All right, that's the before and after for Avogadro. Okay. Sometimes, though, it's not convenient or even possible to hold all these facts, hold two of them constant, let the other two vary. Sometimes in the real world, three or maybe all of them are variable. So what we need is a law that can um, adjust for that. Now, uh, yeah, hold it right there. Come back to that in a minute. This is known as the combined gas law. If we start with Boyle's law, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, and we say, all right, well, we know that varies uh, according to this law, but we also know that volume varies with temperature. But we also know that volume varies with moles. So there's your combined gas law. Now, in this case, um, like any other equation, if you know all the factors except one, you can solve for it. And they can all vary. They don't necessarily have to vary. For instance, 
if you know that the number of moles of gas are the same before and after, then this term drops out and you're just left with PV over T. Right? So you can derive each of the gas laws from this one. Just hold two of them constant and you got the other, you got the gas law. Um, this uh, part C is trying to draw your attention to the balanced equation for the decomposition of ammonia to nitrogen and hydrogen gas. Um, and the, the relationship here between volume and moles. So volume and moles. So if we hold the pressure and the temperature constant, then V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. And uh, with this equation, the balanced equation, this is a gas, and it gives us hydrogen gas and uh, nitrogen gas. And then we need the balanced equation for that one, which is two here and let's see, three here, I think. The relationship, since these are all gases and these coefficients represent moles, we can say for two moles of ammonia decomposed, we get three moles of hydrogen and one mole of nitrogen. So if we took um, two moles here and completely decomposed it, how many moles of gas would we get from that? We get four. It goes from two to four. So we're going from two moles here to four moles there. So what does that do to the volume? Well, if this doubles, then the volume would double, wouldn't it? We'd double the volume. If the moles double and they're directly proportional, then the volume doubles. And that's what we're trying to show in, in this equation. Um, if we start off with 35 cubic feet of gas, and all of this decomposes, none of it's left, now we have this in the, the container at constant temperature and pressure, then the volume should double. It should be 70 cubic feet. Okay? That's what that says. I know I'm going to run over today. Uh, oh, this is a slide on combining them all. all right. So uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time here. I'm adding Charles law with the second step, volume and temperature, and then adding Avogadro's law with the fourth step. And that's what we got here. I use uh, initial and final in the slides, but uh, one and two work just as well. Okay. That's, these are all before and after. If you know conditions before, no conditions of ap after, and one of variables is unknown, then you can solve for it using this method. But suppose you don't know before and after. Suppose you only know conditions right now, the current state. How do you solve that problem? Well, you need the relationship here. Let's take the combined gas law again. Uh, P1, let's see, P1, V1 over N1, T1 is equal to a constant. Okay. So if that's true, and we know values for this, 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 and this, we can calculate that constant. So let's say we're going to let the pressure equal to one atmosphere. Okay. And we're going to let the, uh, the amount equals one mole. And the temperature is going to be the standard temperature for gases is zero degrees. Standard temperature for everything else is 25. But for gases, if, it's, if we're dealing with gas laws, it's zero degrees. So that would be 273K. Right? Now all we need to know is what's the volume of that gas under these conditions? Right? It's been measured. 22.4 liters. Okay. Now, where did you get the 22.4? Measured it. 
you have to measure it. <clears throat> Under these conditions, one atmosphere pressure, one mole of gas at 273K is 22.4 liters. Then we can calculate a constant. And that constant is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole K. That's the constant. So if we solve the problem using these units of volume, pressure, and well, moles, amount, and temperature, then we can use that constant and we give this one a special designation called R. You will probably see the equation more often written like this. Okay, that just solves it to make it all in the numerator. So you just take NT over here NRT is there, and PV is over here. And this equation will work with any units of pressure, volume, uh, moles, and temperature, as long as the constant is chosen correctly. If the constant is this one, the units of measure must be liter atmosphere mole K. So you can, you can take this one, if you have pressure, volume, temperature, that's a constant. You can calculate the number of moles. It doesn't matter what it started at. You know what it is right now. But the units must be must conform with the constant. And there are various versions of this constant. Right? There's probably several pages of them in the reference manuals. So that's known as the ideal gas equation. Okay, um, these are defining characteristics of our ideal gas. Uh, the first one I've mentioned already, um, it, the gas remains a gas at all pressures and temperatures. Right? No matter how, the, how high the pressure gets, uh, how low the temperature gets, it's always a gas. It has a point molecular volume. Right? Understand what that is? Remember math when they were talking about um, that's a point. Does it have any area? No, it has no dimensions at all. It's just a point. A line would have a single dimension, a linear dimension. Uh, a square, a rectangle, or whatever would have two dimensions, right? Length and height. And a three-dimensional would have length, height, and depth. Gases are considered to be point molecular volumes. In other words, they had no volume. I mean, they're, they're just defined by a, a no volume point in space. That's an ideal gas. <clears throat> um, and not only that, they got no volume and they don't interact with other gases. So uh, if we do consider them to have mass and velocity, which is kinetic energy, then when they impact one another, right, when they impact one another, they do it just like billiard balls. They have no interaction whatsoever except for transfer of momentum. That's an ideal gas. And of course, they have to obey all the gas laws. Now, real gases when you pressurize and cool them, they will liquefy, and some of them will turn to a solid. Um, nitrogen gas from the air, if you pressurize and cool it, it'll turn into a liquid at minus 195 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere pressure. Uh, carbon dioxide will actually, it'll turn into a solid, right? dry ice. So dry ice is minus 78.5 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> so that's a real gas. They do actually have volumes. That's a real gas. 
So only under certain circumstances, we have to take these factors into consideration. And I'll explain the, the conditions under which you can treat a real gas as an ideal gas in just a minute. They do interact with each other. Sometimes they attract, sometimes they repel. And they interact with the walls of the container. In other words, they smack against the wall and transfer momentum to the wall, which is not a big deal unless you've got a, a gauge attached to them. If they didn't interact with the walls, they wouldn't interact with the gauge either, and you wouldn't be able to measure pressure. So there might be gas in there, but you never know it. So they do interact with the walls of the container. Now, most gases behave ideally at low pressure. In other words, and another way of saying that is low moles. Very few, a small amount of gas in a large volume will contribute to ideal behavior and high temperature. Now, the low pressure of the low moles uh, means that they're, the encounters are very infrequent and there's lots of space between them. So you can keep compressing them and they still don't interact much. High temperature means that when they do interact, they're not together very long. Right? They hit at high speed and the energy that's transferred overcomes any type of interaction that they would undergo. So when you slow them down, you get them really cold, then they have time to interact. They smack at very low speed and they interact. So then you see the real gas behavior rear its ugly head. Now, under what conditions can we assume that these are? One atmosphere pressure, room temperature. Those are ideal conditions. All right. Uh, all right. This one, this uh, ideal gas equation that I just gave you was proposed by Emil Clapeyron. All right. You're going to hear his name again in the early 1800s. This uh, ideal gas equation. Now, there's the gas constant that we derived earlier. Here's another gas constant in SI units, right? These are not SI units, but they're very useful. And we're going we're gonna to use those for most of our gas calculations in this chapter. Only when we, when we come to, the, um, to introduce energy terms, joules is a unit of energy, then we'll switch and use a different R. And we'll, it'll probably be this one. 8.3145. You don't have to worry about that one for this chapter. We'll get that one later when we get into thermochemistry and, and thermodynamics later. Oh, that'd be in the second semester, I think. Uh, just make the point that uh, depending on the constant you use, the units of your variables must agree with the constant. Uh, and you can ar arrange the equation in different ways, solve it for which, whichever one you want. All right, so we have we actually have four variables. If you know three of them, you can solve for the fourth one. You can even ratio them. I mean, if you want moles per unit volume, right, we could ratio those two, and then that would answer a question. It just depends on the question. All right. So here's the situation. What's the pressure of the system with two moles of gas, 37 degrees C and 50 liters? We have to change the temperature to Kelvin. Moles is correct. Liters is correct. All right, so we can rearrange for pressure and plug in the values that we know. We change the temperature here. Liters is good. There's your constant. There's your moles. And those values cancel. And, and we know that under those conditions, there should be 1.018 atmospheres in that container. All right, here's one where we have a negative Celsius temperature, right? That wouldn't work in the equation. So it has to be converted to uh, K. 
Kelvin. And then we also have to convert millimeters of mercury into atmospheres if we're going to use 0 0.08206. Okay. Right. We find that that container should have almost eight moles of gas under those conditions. All right. <clears throat> What we're headed for here, and I'm already over. Let me see how much more I got to do. So if you have to go, I will understand. So, <clears throat> One thing we can use uh, gas laws for is solving stoichiometric problems involving gases. Um, I don't know if you remember when I when I handed out the um, review document for the chapter where we were doing stoichiometry, there were two or three of them that were crossed out. They were using gas laws to solve the problems, and we hadn't covered them yet, so that's why I crossed them out. But we once we get through this, now we can solve gas problems in stoichiometry. And it works the same way. You've got a balanced equation. Even though you've got gases in there, in order to move from one place to another, you have to calculate moles. So one of the ways to calculate moles is if you have the right uh, values given to you, then you can determine the number of moles using that ideal gas equation. So calculate the mass of um, a mercury-2 oxide needed to produce 220 cubic centimeters or 0.22 uh, liters of oxygen at 25 degrees Celsius and 740 millimeters of mercury. Right, so there's your conversions already. So we need to know the number of moles of oxygen before we can calculate the mass. Uh, and we're using this equation, right? So if we're going to find out the, the mass of the mercury-2 oxide, we're going to calculate the number of moles of oxygen first, and then use the equation to, to determine the stoichiometry and the output or the input of mass of mercury-2 oxide. So let's see, if we do it correctly, we get that many moles of oxygen, then we put it into our conversion. We want to go from oxygen to uh, mercury-2 oxide. And that gives us moles of mercury-2 oxide. And then we convert that using the molar mass of mercury-2 oxide. And that tells us we started off with 1.8693 grams of mercury-2 oxide to give us that much oxygen under those conditions. So what volume was produced? Well, now that we know the mass and we know the density uh, of, actually, the, that no, we need to do another ca calculation. We've got to convert moles of oxygen to moles of mercury. Okay, that gives us moles of mercury. And then we use that. Uh, once we've got the mass of mercury, we can use its density to find out the volume. There we go. So that's the volume of mercury that was produced as a consequence of that decomposition. And that's the way that the uh, researchers used to produce oxygen. They would decompose mercury to oxide and produce pure oxygen. Okay. This is the method that we're going to use next uh, at the end of the semester, the last test that we're going to do. It's called the Dumas method. Now, this is this is not uh, Alexander Dumas, you know, the Three Musketeers. This is a different Dumas. And um, he, he did work with a number of different things, but this is one method he, he developed for determining the molar mass or the molecular weight, I, I've abbreviated there, of a gas. Actually, not 
of the gas, but of a volatile liquid. So you have to vaporize the volatile liquid at relatively low temperature and use the gas loss to determine how many moles you have in the container. And this is this is the, uh, let's see. Yeah, he was active in organic chemistry and analyses. Let's see. Uh, okay, here we go. So, with these two equations, the ideal gas equation and the equation for the molar mass of any compound, mass divided by moles, we can put those together and create a new equation. Right, solve for moles, mass divided by molar, molar mass, and substitute that into the ideal gas equation. And we can calculate the molar mass if we know the mass of the gas contained in the container, in the container, yeah. We know the gas constant, we know the temperature, we know the pressure, we know the volume. We can calculate the molar mass of, of that volatile liquid uh, as a consequence of this experiment. Be more details later. Uh, actually, this slide goes into a lot of detail and since we don't have a lot of time, um, I'm going to save the, the detailed discussion of this until we actually do the lab. I'll leave it on there long enough to be recorded, and then if you want to, you can stop it and look at it. I think there's a font issue in there. I see those squares between liters and atmospheres. In fact, the, the liters, that should be capitalized. But that square should be a, a a dot or a time symbol. All right. Uh, hmm. All right. This is what type of equation uh, would we need for this? We're starting off with 50 liters of gas at 250 degrees C and 750 millimeters of mercury. And we cool it to 25 degrees and compress it to 900 millimeters of mercury. You're changing the pressure, you're changing the temperature. And the question is, what's its final volume? That's a before and after situation. So would you use the combined equation? And since the moles are the same before and after, those two terms drop out. So you have PV over T equals PV over T. And that's the way this problem is solved. So 23.75 liters. Okay. Um, all right, here's that same decomposition of ammonia. What's the final pressure of a system when so many cubic feet of ammonia at this temp at that pressure and temperature rapidly heated to 500 and the vessel expands to 30? All right, we have to make conversions so that we can use the equation. And let's see. In this case, we do have a change in moles, so we have to keep the moles in the equation. It's going to, notice that the final moles is in the numerator, so that's four moles total, and in the denominator, we have the initial moles at two, two. So we have to keep the moles in this one because we're actually undergoing a chemical reaction in the process. If we do that, then we come out with uh, a final pressure of 1,700 millimeters of mercury. So that's like two and a quarter atmospheres. All right. So what do we mean by partial pressure? Partial pressure of a gas is a term that's applied to mixtures of gases. So if you have, uh, 
if you have a gas, um, uh, if you have gas one mixed with gas two, each one of these will apply its own pressure and add those pressures together, pressure of this one, pressure of this one, you get a total pressure. That's easy to measure. You can measure the total pressure. But that total pressure is due to the pressure that this one would exert independently in that same container. And this one would exert independently in that same container. We can do that because under most conditions that we're going to study, these gases do act independently. So it's just a summation of their pressure that gives you the total. And this is, I thought I had these slides out of order. Oh, no, it's coming. Then the next slide. <clears throat> what am I trying to show here? <clears throat> it contributes its own partial pressure. And we can solve for the partial pressure from this equation for any of the gases in there. That pressure equals moles R T V. So any of the gases could be set up as this. We could have this gas one as uh, the volume one R uh, should be at the same temperature. And they're occupying the same volume. Right? And then the moles of the second gas at the same temperature and the same volume. So the only thing that's changed between the two is the number of moles of each one. So if we factor those out, right, we factor R, T over V out, and that's moles one plus moles two. So what this illustrates is that this total pressure is due to the moles of each gas. No other, fa no other factors need being uh, considered. Right, there we go, moles one, moles two. Right, we've got three in this case. So the total pressure is due to um, well, let's see. Uh, this one then would be what? Would be the total pressure would be uh, the total moles divided by RT over V. So then we can factor the RT over V out of this one, which would be the same as the others. Oops, sorry. And this would be by n total. And this is the same on both sides of the equation. So n1 plus, plus n2 equals total moles. Now that's not telling us something we didn't already know. But the, if we divide both sides through by total, 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 we can do that mathematically speaking in total. We get another value that's useful. It's called mole fraction. I've run out of room here. Let's go up like this. So N1 divided by total is the mole fraction of one. And then plus the mole fraction of two equals what? That divided by that's one. And what we're saying is that um, we're just saying this is the molar fraction of each gas in the container. Uh, the, the number of moles of the one divided by the total is the mole fraction. And all the mole fractions of each of the gases has to equal one. Okay. That's all we're saying for that. Um, and then we can also say that the, the partial pressure of each one of these gases, this is equal to the mole fraction of one times the total. And this is equal to the mole fraction of two times the total. So the partial pressures are related to their mole fractions. That's what we're saying. They're directly proportional. 
All right. I think I got the slide out of order. I should have introduced Dalton's law of partial pressure before we get into this. But it is what it is. So consider this equation. What is this the equation of? This is the explosive decomposition of nitroglycerin. C3H5N309 is the molecular formula for nitroglycerin. And when it decomposes, it does so rapidly, and it goes from four moles of gas to 29 moles. Four to 29 is, is a huge change in moles of gas. That's where the explosive force of nitroglycerin comes from. It's that decomposition. So under these conditions, if this nitroglycerin is contained in a 100 liter vessel, which is pretty big, at 25 degrees and 20 millimeter mercury pressure, so it's, it's partially evacuated, which is probably a good thing. It, it preserves your vessel. And... Um, the, the vessel actually is allowed to change volume. And it goes from 100 liters to 110 liters. And the temperature rises to 400 degrees. So it's an exothermic reaction also. It gives up heat. We calculate the final pressure. Right, so there we've we solved the, the uh, combined gas equation for pressure. And now we need to insert the values. All right, so there's millimeters of mercury. Uh, wait a minute. Yep, we can do that because this is this is a, a ratio. This is the combined equation. So we can use millimeters of mercury. Uh, liters, liters. There's your moles, 29 moles of gas after, four moles of gas before, and there are the temperatures. And when we solve that, we find that the pressure should have increased from 20 up to 297 millimeters of mercury. All right. Uh, what else are we going to do with that equation? What's the partial pressure of each one of these gases? All right. So the easiest way to calculate the partial pressure is to determine the mole fraction. And the mole fraction is based on the stoichiometry of the equation. If we've got 29 total moles of gas final and carbon dioxide, it starts is 12 of that, then its mole fraction is 12 divided by 29 times the final pressure we determined at 297. So the final uh, pressure of carbon dioxide is 123. And we use the mole fraction of each one to determine its partial pressure in the final gas. So most of the pressure is, is contributed by carbon dioxide <laughs> and a fairly substantial amount by water. And if we add up all those pressures, they should come close to 297. Okay. Where is... Did I miss a slide altogether? Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures? Oh. I think my slide set's messed up. I'm missing a slide. Yeah. Well, let me just put it up here for posterity's sake. Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Simply says that the total pressure of any mixture of gases in a container is the summation 
of the part of the pressures of each of the gases that would be expressed if they were in that same container by themselves, independent of all the others, up to as many as you want. That's it. And that's John Dalton. Okay. Now I want to look at the kinetic molecular theory, right? Up to this point, we've been talking about uh, laws and there's been no real attempt to explain why gases behave the way they do. That's what the kinetic molecular theory does. There's some basic postulates that are made about the theory in order to uh, confine its value. Large numbers of particles called atoms and molecules are present. Particle size is small compared to the distance between them. That defines a gas. These gases, are, uh, these particles are in constant rapid motion, very fast. In fact, we do some calculations later in this uh, presentation, and you'll find that um, under some circumstances, those the average velocity of those uh, gas particles exceeds the speed of sound. They do collide. That's inevitable. And they also collide with the walls of the container, which produces measurable pressure. What we're saying is we know that each one of the particles in there does not have the identical kinetic energy of any other particle. But what we're saying is that at a given temperature, the average kinetic energy of all the particles is the same. That's where we're using our statistical approach. And we have to assume for ideal circumstances that there's no interaction among the gases. When they collide with each other, they act just like billiard balls. They just bounce off. They transfer momentum, and that's it. Okay. Um, so how does that explain uh, all right. I need to say something first. How does that explain the various laws? When we say pressure times volume is constant, as we increase the pressure on a gas, what does that do to the confined gas? Well, it still has the same kinetic energy if the temperature is constant. But if you decrease the volume, uh, in other words, if you increase the pressure, excuse, excuse me, um, we change the volume and the pressure responds. No, we change the pressure and the volume responds. As we increase the pressure, the volume decreases because we are uh, uh, adding more force to the confined gas. And as we increase the force, then the only way it can respond is to decrease its volume until it reaches equilibrium again. If we do volume over temperature, actually this one's a little easier to understand. If we increase the temperature, we're increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules. They're smacking against the walls of the container and the piston with greater force and causes it to rise. And then if we have, um, let's see, volume and moles, Avogadro, and if we, if we pack more molecules into the container at the same temperature, they have the same kinetic energy of it as everybody else, but there's more of them. So they deliver more force against the same outward pressure and the volume has to increase. Okay. Now we can move to the next one. And John Dawson's the same guy that uh, proposed the uh, atomic theory. All right, suppose we, what we're trying to do here is to draw a distinction between uh, average 
arithmetic average as a way of getting at the um, um, the energies of particles and their velocities versus the weighted average. So if we take seven balls, seven bowling balls, for instance, and we have their masses and velocities. Well, let's see, they're all five kilograms, so the masses are the same, but they have different velocities, right? 10 through 70 meters per second. And we can calculate their, their kinetic energy based on that formula, one half mv squared. <clears throat> um, and this energy will be in terms of, let's see, yeah, kinetic energy is joules. Yeah, joules. Then we get this list of energies. If we calculate the average uh, velocities, we just take add all the velocities and divide by seven, we get 40 meters per second. If we take the um, energies and take the average energies, we get 5,000 joules as the average energy. Okay. If we rearrange that equation, um, kinetic energy equals one half mass times velocity. And then we plug in the actual energies here, right? We've rearranged this equation to put energy here and solve for velocity. Then what would the velocity be if we took the average energy and applied it to one five kilogram mass? That's what we're doing here. So when we solve it for that uh, velocity, the velocity says it should be 44.7 meters per second, not 40. So there's the discrepancy. If we just simply average the velocities, we don't get the right uh, value for velocity that will give us the true average energy. Okay, So what we need is a way to get at the uh, an averaging value for velocity that will give us the correct energy. And that's where, let's see, is it coming up? I hope it's coming up. Okay, let's let's move ahead with this and, and I'll be sure we don't miss the point, hopefully. So if we had the ability to determine the energies of every particle moving in that box, each one would have three axes of motion, right? It'd be a combination of this way, this way, and that way, right? So if it moved off that way, it would have a component from this way, that way, and that way. And that's what this is showing. Its energy would be relative to its x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis components. That's all we're saying there. If we had a mole of those particles, then we'd multiply that, that by a mole. The root mean square velocity is the velocity of the particle based upon their average kinetic energies. So the root mean square, actually, if you take, you take the, the, uh, the words, oops, I got my A. If you took the words and worked your way backwards, then it's easier to understand. Right. That's a calculation of the root mean square. So what we're saying is that if we take the velocity, the, the velocities of all of the balls, right, 10, 20, 30, 40, all the way up to 70, I think, and we take those, and before we do anything to them, we square them. Right. So if we go back and say 10 through 70, We've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And we square those values. That would be 100, right? 400, 900, 1600, 2500, 3600, and 4900. That's the square part. You square each of the values. Then you take the mean of the squares. 
Let's see, where's my calculator? We want to add these together. 100, 400, 900, 1600, 500, 3600, 4900. And then divide by 7. Let's put that value down. This will be 1.4 times 10 to the fourth. And then we're going to take the average and divide by 7. So we do the square them, then we take the mean of the squares, and that leaves two times 10 to the third. And then we take the uh, square root of that value. So two times 10 to the third, we take the square root. All right, so we've done squared, mean, square root. Root mean squared. And let's see there. And that should, that will give us 44.7 meters per second. That's the value we got by the other method on that previous page, 44.7. So the root mean square of those values will give us the value that corresponds to average energy. Now, people use root mean square every day. They just don't realize it. Um, the power coming from that socket right there is alternating current, which means um, it goes over time. Right? It'll go like this and like that, and like that. And it goes up to, uh, let's say I measured it at one time. It, like, it goes up to maybe 250 volts this way and then 250 volts that way. No, I'm sorry. That's not right. Goes up to maybe 150, 150. Because the root mean square voltage is 110 or 115 volts. Okay. So we use root mean square all the time. We just don't realize it. Okay. And that's this equation. Uh, the mu, that little mu, is velocity. I, I use V, but they use mu. Now, we can associate, and you're not going to have to derive this, but you do need to know how to use the equation. We can associate the root mean square velocities of gases to their temperature and their molar mass. All right, so the root mean square velocity, let me use their terminology, root mean square velocity of any of the particles uh, of any gas is proportional to the square root of three times uh, gas constant times temperature over molar mass. Okay, so what that says is the root mean square velocity, if the temperature is the same, then the root mean square velocity will uh, decrease as the molar mass increases. Let's see. No, that's not right. Is it right? Yeah, they're inversely proportional. But we have to use a different gas constant. We have to use the 8.30145. I thought we were going to use that with this. I guess we are. So you have two gas constants that are applicable. One is where you have liter atmospheres per mole K, and this one is joules per mole K. And the temperature still has to be K. That has to be K. This is 8.3145. And the molar mass has to use the units that are common to, to R. I have to use um, fundamental units. So the molar mass, instead of being grams per mole, is kilograms per mole. That's one condition for making this work. All right. So let's see if we can calculate the uh, 
the root mean square velocity of air. All right. What we need is an average molar mass. And at this temperature, 37 degrees. So we take the, the molecular weight of air on average is 29 grams per mole. That's including the effect of nitrogen and oxygen. So that's the, the we're using this as the average mass of air. We convert it to kilograms per mole. Then we can substitute values. Right, there's our, our constant. There's our three constant temperature and then kilograms per mole in the denominator. And we solve that and find out 516 meters per second. Now that, I don't have an intuition about that value. So if we convert it to miles per hour, now I have a feeling for it, right? What's the speed of sound? Well, it's like about 760 miles per hour. So it's, it's a lot faster than the speed of sound. The average velocity of air molecules. So it may make you wonder, you know, why don't they knock you over? Well, because they're going in all directions. Uh, they equalize each other out. If we calculate the same thing for helium, we find that helium has to be moving faster at that temperature. And that's why your voice changes when you breathe helium from a balloon and try to talk. Because the molecules are moving faster and um, frequency of your voice is related to velocity. Okay, this is our last law, Graham's Law of Infusion. Graham's Law of Effusion. Sometimes it's called Graham's Law of Diffusion. But effusion and diffusion are two different processes. They're, they're related, but they're not exactly the same but we can use the law to solve either problem. Okay, let's say we have two gases, A and B, at the same temperature. And um, let's see, what's V? Is volume, volume must, uh, V must be velocity because velocity times time is distance, remember? Velocity is a change in distance with a change in time. Right? So velocity times time would be distance. Okay, so V is velocity in this case. Um, so the velocity of A and the velocity of B are going to be different. If they if they're different molar masses, then they're going to be different. We've already shown that. So the distance that A travels is based upon its velocity times the same time period as the velocity of B times its time would give a different distance. If we substitute um, the velocity here, the velocity is equal to this term right there for A and this term for B, All right? So now um, we combine the two under the same square root symbol, which is mathematically allowed. And 3RT is the same in both of their numerators. They cancel out. But when we do that, okay, we've got this one divided by that one, that one. We've got, uh, yeah, 3RT, 3RT, 3RT. We have the molar mass of A and the molar mass of B, like that. This one cancels, that one cancels. So we've got one over molecular weight and we got uh, one over molecular weight. Well, the denominator of the, of the denominator is the numerator, right? So the molecular weight of B goes in the numerator. And then this one is the denominator of the numerator, which is the denominator. So that becomes this expression, square root of molecular weight of B divided by molecular weight of A will give you the same ratio as the average velocity of A divided by the average velocity of B. So one way to look at this is the distance that the two gases travel with respect to each other is inversely proportional to the square root of their molecular weights. 
In other words, uh, and I think I've got an animation in here. We can use that to determine the molecular weight of an unknown gas. Uh, here's an example where we have both knowns and we're going to say, all right, when uh, hydrogen chloride and ammonia meet, they form a solid, ammonium chloride. And I've used this in the fume hood to uh, uh, test the flow of gas. If you have a beaker here of concentrated hydrog hydrogen chloride, hydrochloric uh, acid, and you have a beaker here of ammonia, well, they're going to vaporize like that, vaporize like that, and they form ammonium here. Well, since it's a solid, uh, it forms like a fog, and you can see the fog drifting away with the, the fume hood draft. <clears throat> All right, what's the question? Well, if we relate the distance that ammonia moves to the distance that hydrogen chloride moves, then it's proportional to the square root of the molecular weight of hydrogen chloride to the molecular weight of ammonia. So we, we set that up just like we solved it in the previous slide. And then we actually put the values in. So what's the ratio there? Ratio is 1.46, which means what? Which means if we have a tube, We have a, a, a plexiglass tube right here, and we put a cotton ball here with ammonia in it, and a cotton ball here with hydrogen chloride in it. That means the ammonia is going to, to travel one and a half times the distance that hydrogen chloride would. So they're going to meet right here somewhere. Let's see if I've got an animation. There it is. Okay. And you can use this, um, as long as the chemistry is right, you can use this to determine the uh, molar mass of an unknown gas. Right? Because all you need is to measure that ratio of the distances and plug it in this equation with the unknown uh, molar mass of the gas and solve for it. There's one other way to determine the molar mass of a gas, a molar mass of a compound without knowing what the compound is, right? Remember, we need that to do the molecular formula from the empirical formula. And this is one way that you do it. Oops, you need more? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, so in this case, we're doing just that. Uh, X is the unknown. We know that it's going to react with ammonia so to, to tell us exactly where they meet. And we know that the distance that ammonia moves is 87.9 centimeters. So the distance that X moves is 120 minus 87 because the tube is that long, 120. And the ratio is 2.738. So we apply that to our Graham's law expression and we solve for the unknown. So you put the 2.738 above the 17? Or? Um, let's see. That's a mathematical question there. Let's see. If we had 2.738738 equals the square root of molecular weight of X divided by 17.0305. Okay. You'd have to get rid of the uh, the square root in order to, to then manipulate the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So what I would do, yeah. I saw. What I would do is square both sides. You just square this one and square that. And this square would negate that square root. So now you would have the molecular weight of X over here, about about 17.0305, would be equal to, 
that value squared. 2.738 squared. This would be 7.4966. This would be times that. times 17.0305 would equal, equal the molecular weight of X. Okay. Thank you. It's good for me to stay in practice, too. There we go. And the molecular weight would then be 127. So which one of these could it possibly be? If we have these choices, it'd have to be hydrogen iodide. Okay, the problem, no, hydrogen iodine is a gas. Yeah. Iodine itself, I2, is a solid, but hydrogen iodide is a gas, so that would work. Okay, uh, is this the last slide? Next to the last. Okay, I'll try not to spend too much time on this. This is a, a picture of one of the uh, uh, nuclear refining plants in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Here it is, right there. The thing is huge. It's a mile long, 44 acres under foot, under roof. And uh, as a kid, I was growing up in Oak Ridge and they had three of these plants. Each one did uh, purified uh, uranium in a different way. This particular plant, uh, K25, was dedicated to this uh, effusion process. So they would take um, naturally occurring uranium, which was a combination of 238 and 235 primarily, and convert them to hexafluorides, which is a gas at an elevated temperature. But it wasn't, the, uh, you didn't have to, if you had pure uranium, the temperature would be prohibitive. But turn it into a fluoride, and then you can, you can turn it into gas fairly easily. The problem was, uh, what you would do is, you would pass it through a sieve. Right? And imagine tiny holes in the sieve. The gas that would go through the fastest was the highest velocity one, which would be this one, right? based upon our uh, Graham's law. So it would go through the sieve and be partially enriched because this would come through after it, uh, but you would have U-235 uh, on this side in enriched, not by much, just a little bit. And then you would put another one here and another one here and you stack them, thousands of them. That's why the plants are big. The problem was what material could you use? Because uranium hexafluoride is extremely corrosive. Right? There was no metal that we had to do it, not even stainless steel. It would just eat it up. Fortunately, DuPont had invented a product just a few years ahead of this. Um, let's see, got the name. Plunkett, Dr. Roy Plunkett in, in, uh, discovered Teflon. Um, and DuPont made the, the sieves out of Teflon. And they just stacked them in there and pressurized the gas and pushed it through. And by the time it got to the end, it was enriched enough that we could produce an atom bomb from it. Now we don't do it that way anymore. But now it's more efficient to use ultra centrifuges. But it did work. And uh, here's the equation. It only, uh, the difference in velocity was, was only like uh, four-tenths of a percent. Right? So it wasn't much. But it was enough if you used a, a lot of them. And here's the, the website that will give you more information if you want to go look at it. But this, these plants, all of them, had 12-foot um, fences with uh, razor wire at the top. And... Uh, the guards would shoot first and ask questions later. But it had a road around it, followed the, the fence line, and uh, 
my family wasn't that rich. So for entertainment, we would hop in the car and drive around the, the plant, take about 15 minutes to go around the thing. <clears throat> okay, one last idea is uh, ideal gases versus real gases. So as long as the conditions were conducive to treating gas as ideal, then the uh, the gas equation could be written this way, and it would work perfectly well. But uh, many chemists and physicists were working with gases under extreme conditions of pressure and temperature, uh, low temperature, uh, high pressure, and high moles. So they needed a correction, and that correction was provided for them by uh, Van der Waals in 1873. In fact, he got a, a Nobel Prize for his work with real gases. And this is his modification to the uh, ideal gas equation. He had a, uh, he had this P value, but instead of V, he had an expression in here with this proportionality constant, and then uh, the number of moles divided by V squared. Okay. And then for the volume correction, uh, excuse me, uh, P, pressure correction. Oh, excuse me. No, that's not right. This is the correction for the pressure. And then for the volume, the correction was uh, volume minus moles times another proportionality value. And these, this A and this B had to be uh, experimentally determined for each gas. There was no way around it. But the rest of the equation stayed the same in RT. You just had a correction for pressure and correction for the volume. This is Van der Waals corrections for the ideal equation. Now, you don't have to remember that. I'm just giving that to you as an illustration of, of what's required if you're going to be a chemical engineer because the, the conditions that are often imposed on your gases are extreme. Particularly if you've got a, a reaction that's going on, a catalyzed reaction in a, a, I don't know, a petroleum or cracking plant, and you're trying to promote a certain reaction, then it's, going, it's not going to happen that I, under ideal conditions. All right, I think that's the last slide. Yep, yeah. we're done.